Jesus was the Savior, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He was, he was the Redeemer. He, he rescued people from sins. He was their Savior. Then the next, if you like, side of the square, and if I can turn my back to you, was, was that he was a healer. Jesus is our, our healer. He heals us of our iniquities, our sins, and, and heals our physical bodies. Not just that, but he's also our baptizer. He's a baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He, he fills us anew. He fills us afresh. He, he brings new life into our bodies. It's not just a physical thing that goes on, goes on, but he baptizes us with the promised Holy Spirit that Jesus talks about. So that's Jesus the Savior, Jesus the uh, healer, Jesus the, the baptizer. But then we get on to the first one. And the first element was this, that Jesus is our coming king. Jesus is our coming king. Listen, if you're not sure what to pray about when you get up or if you're walking around your room when you want to go to each corner of your room and say, Jesus, you're my saviour. Jesus, you're my redeemer. Jesus, you've lifted me from a mighty long way. You've taken my sins so far away from me. I'm so grateful for that. If you're not sure what to do next, go and stand in the other corner of your room, folks. Say, Lord, you're my healer. Lord, I need you to heal my body. I need you to heal my mind. Then when you move on from that, go and say, Jesus, you're my baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Jesus, fill me afresh. Pour your spirit out into my life. Jesus, I need you. And then when you're not sure what to do next, go and say, Lord, I thank you that you're coming back. Lord, I thank you that, that you're going to come. You're going to come as you promised, as you said you would, and you're going to change everything. So that's the four square gospel, folks, in about 30 seconds. There you go. The same Jesus who walked this earth 2,000 years ago will be coming back. I love it when it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. You can go there if you want. There's only a short verse I want to do to you. Um, Paul is writing to the, Thessalon the church in, in um, the Thessalonians, to say that. And he was writing to them. And he said that, I've heard about what you've done. I have heard a report about you. And Paul, Paul had heard three things about them. He said, that you've turned away from your sins. No, let me read it. It says, they tell me you turned to God from idols to serve the living true God. The, 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 the characteristics of their walk was that they had turned from what they were doing before and had started a new way of life. They turned from what they knew was wrong and were, were, were turning to serve God and serve his purposes. But not just that. They goes on to say, and this was one thing that, they, that stood out for them in their walk with God, was that, and you wait and to wait for his son from heaven. They were known for being people who had turned from their sons, but they were also known for people who were waiting for God's return, waiting for Jesus to come back to the earth, waiting for him to return as he said he would. I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't like waiting for things. I really don't like if I'm going to wait for a bus, if I'm going to wait for the microwave to go ding, because I don't know how to use the oven, if I'm going to wait. You know, to go dig there, then I get so impatient. I haven't got any tolerance. I can't do it. I just want it there and then. But folks, as a church, as a body of believers, we should be known for our waiting. Waiting on Jesus to return. Waiting on that he's going to come back. Waiting for when he does, things are going to change. And I just put a few things that I, I just want to walk through with you to know where we get this from, what we're going to be looking at, just so you know if this gets a little bit heavy, that the end is in sight, okay? So, so we're going to just look at how do we know he will return, why will he return, what will it be like when he returns, and when will he return? So the first thing, to the person next to you and say, he needs help. <laughs> he needs some help this morning. So how do we know that Jesus is coming back? The easy answer is, folks, is that Jesus told his disciples. Jesus told his disciples that he would come back. And we don't just know it as a passing phrase that he made. There was actually evidence of it in all four Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 24, verse 30, says this. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. We go on to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 13, verse 26, and it says, At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Same things were emphasized in Mark 
after in that second gospel. Luke chapter 21, it says this, people will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they, they will see the Son of Man coming in cloud, in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your heads because the, your redemption is drawing near. And finally, John's Gospel, chapter 14, a little bit of a different take on it, but Jesus says these words to his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. In that, well, those are great words, folks. I know every season of life you're going through. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. You had a hard week this week. Don't let your heart be troubled. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Keep walking through it. It's amazing how if you just keep walking with Jesus, situations as difficult as they may be, as hard as trying. I know you, some of you folks here, you've been through terrible stuff. You've been through hard stuff. Jesus, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house, we've been thinking about that in my father's house. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So the Gospels are full of Jesus' promise that he is coming back. Not just in the Gospels, though. If you go back to the Old Testament and the prophets, they were full of speaking about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, when that would come. And that was giving reference, not to Jesus coming as a, as a baby, but coming when he comes back in triumph. When he comes back with King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They looked forward to the day of the Lord. And some examples, they thought it would be a terrible day, but some thought it would be a brilliant day as well. Jesus talked about his return using parables as well. Not just that, but in the letters of Peter, James, John, they all referred to the coming of the Lord. So that's how do we know he will return? Because he said so. Next, why will he come back? What's the purpose of Jesus coming back? Well, I want to say this morning, the purpose of Jesus coming back is so that he will finish what he started. 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came back, came, came to the earth as a baby. He came to save individuals. Jesus' word when he was here for 33 years, it was all about saving mankind, saving individuals from their sin. And listen, folks, human history is full of people who try, try and live up to God's standards, try and live a good life, try and do their best. And society is still full of it today. You've only got to turn the news on and look at people trying to do something right, whether it's trying to do this thing or that thing. Listen, Jesus came back so that individuals could be saved, not so that we'd have to work our way up to God. Jesus worked his way down to us so that we could be saved. So he's coming back, not to do what he did the first time, but this time he's coming back to set his rule over the earth. God's purpose is to rule all of the earth. Not just have his way in individuals' lives as they give their life to him, but to rule over all of creation, to rule over the planet, to rule over everything that goes on in our earth. In Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 22, it says this, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. There's a lot in the media at the moment, and has been for a number of years, about what's going on in our environment, our climate. And people will say, listen, if we don't do something, the end's going to come. If we don't do something, irreparable damage. Uh, and it's as if they're, they're giving death cries. There's something, something is dying. I want to turn that around this morning because it's actually not death pangs that they're giving to, the, the, the giving way that the earth is giving to, but they're birth pangs. The earth is giving way to something new that will come. 
a new heaven and a new earth that will come when Jesus returns. Earthquakes, famine, climate change, everything else, they're not things that, it's not as if things are coming to end, but a new world will be born when Jesus comes to the earth. Ephesians 1, chapter 10, verse 10 says this, I'm going to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and the Christ. We looked last week about unity. And folks, God didn't create the world for it to be in a mess. Do you know that? God didn't create individuals for them just to be living in addiction. God didn't create individuals just to make a ruin of their life and get into desperate situations and do crazy things. But he came to that they would have life and life in all its fullness. That was the purpose of creating mankind. And it's the same with the years, folks. Jesus, God didn't create it for just to go and be made a mess of. He's coming back one day, and when he does, it will be a new rule and a new reign over the years where Jesus is in charge. Where Jesus is in charge. So that's why he will come back. And we keep going. Next question, what will it be like when Jesus comes back? Well, I want to say first thing, it's going to be a visible return. It says in Acts chapter 1 verse 10, they were looking intently, this is of the disciples as Jesus left the earth and ascended to heaven, that they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who had been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go to heaven. So the same way that Jesus went up to heaven in that bodily, in that resurrection, resurrected body that he had, he's going to come back in the same way. It's going to be a visible, it's going to be a personal return. And Jesus is coming back in his resurrected body. Not just a body that he had on earth, but the body that he had after the resurrection. The body that he had that would eat with people, but then would be able to suddenly appear in rooms. It was a, a similar body to what we have, but it was altogether different. The Bible talks about it being an incorruptible body. And you know what? When Jesus comes back, he's going to have that incorruptible body. And for those of you and me who have already died... The Bible says that we'll be raised up in resurrected bodies as well, that will be incorruptible. He's going to come back, he's going to be to reign in power. Jesus will return as the king with glory and power to rule and judge. Completely different to how he came to the earth the first time as a baby. As, as a, a meek baby into a stable. Listen, when Jesus comes back the second time, the whole earth is going to know about it. The whole world is going to be able to see it. And go back sort of 50 years ago, when they talk about Jesus coming back and trying to work out, well, how are the whole world, how is the whole world going to see it? Listen, with modern technology, TV, everything like that, it can happen so easily now. We're, can you all remember where you were on certain days? Maybe, looking back, can you remember where you were when J.F. Kennedy was assassinated? Can you remember where you were when England won the rugby, the football world cup? I won't say the rugby world cup. Can you remember where England were? Where you were when England won the football world cup? No. No? I was around. Hey, let me bring this more up today. Can you remember where you were, because I can, when 9-11 happened? Yeah. I can remember where I was. But listen, when Jesus comes back, everyone will be able to see it. Everyone will be able to see it. And it's like, as if you know, when you go to the cinema, you know, as you're there in the cinema beforehand, or you go to a show, and as you're getting ready for the show, there, 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 there are house lights on, aren't there? There are house lights that light up everyone's seats and in the stage, but then, when the scene is about to start, when the film is about to start, the lights dim. And all you can see is what's on the front stage. That's a, an illustration, a picture of what it will be like when Jesus comes back. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the, first, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. Any of you here wish that you didn't have that back pain? Anyone here wish that you could get rid of that long-term injury, you know, that has, has been bothering you for so long? Is that when Jesus comes back to the earth and our bodies are resurrected, there'll be no more pain. When our bodies are resurrected from the ground, there'll be no more hurt. Then there'll be no more aching. There'll be no more soreness. There'll be no more disease in your bodies because you'll have a body like his. It might bear some scars. Uh, so I um, listened to one person and he said, well, he, he was an elderly gentleman and he said, well, Jesus, when he came back, he was 33. He, sorry, when he left this earth, he was 33. So when he comes back, he's going to be 33 when he comes back. Well, he, he was hoping that as a 60-year-old, he's going to come back and resurrected as a 33-year-old. <laughs> Husband, wives, look at your husband and say, man, you're going to be good on the resurrection day. <laughs> I'm 33 now, folks, so this is, this, is, this is as good as it gets, I'm afraid you. <laughs> Final thing. When will it come back? That's the common question, isn't it? The $64 million question. When will he come back? And this is the one really, folks, that has caused so much division and so much debate and so much theorizing and conspiracy and everything like that. When will he return? Revelation 20 talks about the millennial reign of Christ. And there are different groups of people, some Groups who fall into the pre-millennials, pre-millennialists, post-millennialists, amillennialists, other people will be pre-tribulation, the church will be raptured, post-tribulation, mid-trib. I just came across one guy, he said, Rob, I was in a meeting with him, he said, Rob, I believe in, in, in pan-trib. Everything will pan out fine. <laughs> Everything will pan out fine. Acts chapter 1 verse 7, we've already looked at it, says this, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. The reality is, folks, none of us know. And Jesus didn't tell us. He gives us indicators. He gives us certain indicators of all the signs of the times. But no one knows for definite. Uh, we're almost left, not hanging, that's not the right word, but, but we're left um, needing to live in that expectation that Jesus could come back at any time. That's the state that Jesus leaves us in. It's not one of complete certainty, but he gives parables to, 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 um, in order for us to live by, just to give us an indication of, of what will ha happen. And, you know, I am... Um, there's one story that Jesus gives. Let me give it to you now. 1 Peter, no. It's a letter from Peter. 1 Peter 3 verse 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. A thief in the night. We can do something to protect against thieves in the night. What do you do before you go to bed? You make sure the door's locked. You, you, you make sure the lights are out. You might make sure the curtains or the blinds are drawn. You might make sure you've got an alarm system and you fancy like that. You, you might have an alarm system. You put on to protect against the thief. And although we don't know when Jesus comes back, God wants us to be prepared. God wants us to be prepared and ready. And that's part of our lives, folks. Being ready for his return. Not being asleep on the wheel. Not being um, people who just who are just casual with their faith, but people who are prepared and ready today for whenever that day comes. You know what? You could well ask me, why on earth, Rob, does this all matter in 2022? Why do we need to look at this every now and again? I think it's important that we do, folks, because Jesus said it. And if Jesus said something, we've got to take it to be truth. Oh, we've also got to take it with seriousness and importance because he didn't do it for no reason. But he gave us instructions that he would come back. I, I just want to put some things up on the slide about um, what things are like now and what they'll be like then when Christ comes. 
So, so let me just put this uh, on the same. There are three things. Now, folks, our understanding is limited. We don't know everything, do we? We'd love to know a bit more. We'd love to know the date and the hour so that then we can get ready. Why do you think Jesus says that? Why do you think we don't know an exact date? I think I know, folks, because if you're anything like me, sometimes we leave things to the last minute. Sometimes we leave things to the last minute. And if we knew that we had, oh, we've got another 10 years, I can live my life and do what I want. understanding now. But when Jesus comes, we'll have full understanding. Full of understanding of who he is, of his plans and his purposes. What else? We, know. we also know that now we're frail. We're subject to sin, we're subject to sickness. But on that day of his return, let me tell you folks, they will, we will be given a resurrected body resurrected body that won't be there won't be any of those that sickness won't be any of that sin there won't be any of that temptation but we'll have a body that is resurrected just like Jesus is was and Jesus still is and we will be like him what else do we know that now we see evil prospering there's a folks just turn on the news and you think how can they get away with that look at this and you think, how can that be allowed to happen? Evil prospers, evil seems to go on and check. In that day when Jesus is returns, returns, all wrongs will be righted when he comes and sets his rule and reign on the earth. I want to just give you some final things. Musicians, you can come back here. We're just going to lead you off in one final song. You know, if there's one thing about the end time scriptures and the end time prophecies and what Jesus said about his return, one thing, there are a few things that we can't take from it. One of them is that God is in charge. God is in charge. Maybe as things might get worse and worse and worse, folks, God is still in charge. He's still on the throne. Now, the other thing as well how, that we get from these scriptures that we've been looking at today is that God's enemies will be defeated. God's enemies will be defeated once and for all. And the thing that we get from it is that his followers, those who know Jesus, will be with him forever. Isn't that good to know? That we'll be with him forever. And the final thing, folks, that these verses teach us as we get to grips with them is that is that we can't wait to change. No, we can't wait for that day to come and then we'll be ready. Folks, we've got to get ready now. We've got to get ready now. We've got to get our hearts ready now. We've got to get our lives in order now. Don't put it off anymore. But, but you know, how easy is it just to just to you know say, God, I'll, I'll be fully committed when I'm 33. When, I, when I'm married and you've answered that prayer, God, then I'll get serious about you and, and your things. God, God when, when, when it comes to that time, when, 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 I, when, I, when I'm at that age and this has happened to me and that's happened, then I'll get serious. I want to say, folks, teaching of the Bible is that we can't leave it. We have to be ready now. Get us things in order now. Be prepared for it. For when it happens. Be prepared. Because Jesus, coming.